Well, good afternoon. Wow. I would welcome all of you. I feel like a Baptist preacher in South Carolina with nobody sitting on the front row, so you're welcome to move forward uh, if you are inclined to do so. Uh, I'm David Wilkins, uh, former U.S. Ambassador to Canada, and it's great to be back in Ottawa, my home for four years. Uh, I must confess that I enjoy visiting Ottawa more in the summer uh, than I do the winter, uh, being from South Carolina. Uh, but it's great to be back, great to be at this uh, wonderful conference to see a lot of friends and acquaintances I, I knew back several years ago. Uh, when I was in Ottawa, I took French. It didn't take to me. Uh, so I got about as far as bonjour, y'all. So <laughs> bonjour, y'all. Uh, welcome. Thank you very much for attending uh, this session, joining us as we examine infrastructure and project financing in the North. Financing, whether for infrastructure, a mining project, or starting a new, a new business, a small business, remains a chronic challenge for governments, community organizations, and business, both large and small. And our session this afternoon, made up of experts from different financial specialties, will offer insights into ways to obtain different way, to obtain different types of financing now available globally. We have much to cover with our experts, so let's get started. Each of our experts will have been asked to speak up to 20 minutes. I believe most of them will use a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, we will make sure we keep on schedule so we, have, we can make sure that we leave plenty of time for your questions. So with that said, I'm gonna introduce uh, all three uh, simultaneously and each one of them will get up at the podium at their appropriate time. Uh, first speaker will be Mr. Sean Reagan. He is the senior manager with LGM International. He'll look at finance for large infrastructure, energy, and mining projects. Next up from the U.S. Embassy in Ottawa is the Minister Council for Commercial Affairs, Mr. Richard Stephens, who will tell us about the Export-Import Bank of the United States. And our third speaker will be Mark Sin, who is a regional Vice President for Western Canada, Export Development Canada, who'll be talking to us on ca Canadian government financing programs. So with that, we'll begin with our first speaker, Sean Reagan. Uh, good afternoon, thank you. Um, just a quick, one of these, little things is that my greedy superficial job to allow me to consult as I am a business manager with Jacobs Engineering. I run multi-billion dollar projects for them. Um, and I was asked to basically discuss how, how do you infrastructure find, because I've worked in mining and metals in the Arctic Circle in Africa, actually in all seven continents, uh, petrochem and large projects. And what we're trying to focus on in this, as I understand, is really how are you going to get your project? Uh, my, the other speakers are gonna discuss about the multiple funding sources, but the biggest issue I look at is I work with the owners and I work with companies to try to make the deals so that they're done. Um, so I'll discuss project financing issues, decision making, little thing that in the construction side we hear a lot about EVM and how important it is for financial institutions and a little bit about analysis reporting and quick conclusion. Um, this is fun because I usually teach this for about two days. I was just in Russia teaching at the Spurbank and Rothhausen and Alpha Bank. And I usually, I'm trying to do in 20 minutes what I do in two days, so uh, be prepared. It, it's a little quick. Um, the most important thing I look at in project financing, the CII Construction Industry Institute, which is backed by many major companies, financial institutions, and is uh, in Austin at um, University of Te Texas basically states that one of the biggest problems we have is that one out of every three projects that we're trying to do is over budget or behind schedule. And that has a great impact, of course, on our ability to finance. Um, as such, the Institute further gets data that about 61% of these projects meet their cost targets and then 66% um, cannot meet or complete. So with these basically statistics, it's becoming um, more evident that construction, working with owners and working with financing uh, our biggest problem is getting those large finances because of the competition. Um, in the best international practice of financing, what I generally had to look at and continue is basically operational funding versus conventional funding, 
Um, we get into what we call multifunctional, such as export import bank, which uh, Richard's going to talk about next. And then I've done a lot of work with such as the Asian Development Bank and the EBRD. Um, this and combined with the major what we call international financial institutions uh, such as IMF and World Bank, that tends to dictate my financing standards. Um, smallest project I've probably put together the past eight years is 600 million and I've done two projects about three billion. And sitting there and developing the cash flows and the financing, goad or no goad, about 30 percent of the projects. Um, so as such, uh, in that time, I'd worked with Conoco, Sa Saudi Ramco, Western Refining, Spurbank, and numerous other companies. And as you can see here, uh, it's both in mining, infrastructure, um, and oil and gas. Those are the primary, and energy, that's the primary areas I focus in. And understanding this conference, it is critical for everybody here to understand that because of the ability of the Export-Import Bank and the U.S. to bring up services that are a major entity as well as looking at your CapEx and OpEx. So generally the first thing we try to look at in the IFI is everybody builds a great presentation. I can make an ROI spreadsheet which has analysis, but the biggest problem I have, it just really looks good on paper. Half the time they look better on paper than the, than, than the simplified deal. And to the financial, it's going to daze and it's going to wonder, but the biggest problem I, that we run into, can I execute to that? Uh, I predict and do stuff and do my engineering now for projects that are in 2016. What's going to happen to my labor? What's going to happen to oil and gas? What's my return ability to do? And as such, many of these financial packages lack the, the uh, contractual issues. So one of the first things we try to do is just at least get a baseline, either use a FIDIC or an AI, some type of contractual basis to get people to start understanding the terms. And that allows the financial institutions, when we're putting them together, to start levelizing the playing field. And as such, that gives you a base contract schedule, and it gives us our, those specific uh, contractual controls. Uh, FIDIC is very popular in Europe, and it is now gaining a lot of uh, impact in the uh, U.S. But you get into things such as arbitration clauses or mediation. All those need to be discussed at the beginning, but tend to be back-ended when you're doing your financial control. Um, Generally, what I'm looking at uh, is we try to develop for the financials a uh, PMR accounting showing which accounting system I'm I using. Uh, I had a lot of problems working in Russia and Ukraine. Uh, they run this thing called RGAP or UGAP. It's basically accounting based on cash. They do not take in consideration accruals. So as such, that is going to greatly impact your cash flow and structure. So when we're doing these financing, again, one of the areas we tend to see missed is people do not discuss about the accounting standards that are going to be utilized. Um, we tend to basically have to look at uh, an invoice system. How are they getting paid? Uh, in the U.S. and others, you may get zero mobilization. You may have milestone payments. That's critical for the bank because how are they going to fund? Or how are you getting your, are you using OPEX at the beginning? Are you using, what are you going to capitalize? And as such, this impacts our cash strategy. Uh, with Rafazan on a lot of the loans, you have to expend 25% of your loan at the beginning of the project if you're using operational cost, or they start deducting what you have not utilized. So these terms are very important when we're looking at financing these large-scale projects that are going to start 2015, 2016, and go on. Um, a big one that I just worked on was Cove Point LNG, which is an export facility. I did that with Caverner, who then became IHI in the uh, that project had a lot of problems. Again, you're looking at union, non-union, and because of the timing, the cost started going up because of the demand of LNG export based on government rules. So I try to avoid the geopolitical, but they do have an impact on my ability to fund the projects. Um, subcontract packages, uh, are there dictated terms? Do I have to use locals? Uh, the objective of this conference, obviously, would be to try to stimulate the economy and bring locals in. The objective of commercial services and the contractors is to bring the import and maximize the financing, i.e., I get value improvement and I uh, get to fund a project. Nothing's worse than putting a $600 billion bid together and you can't put the cash flow together because you can't get the economics because you can't get manpower. Um, a lot of the tabulations and bulk uh, commodities need to be dictated. Is there a dictation that you have to use local products um, and as such? In a very simple tabular fashion, this is a great system to back up uh, a standard ROI, which you tend to not see. People tend to focus on the pretty PowerPoint picture. 50 pages of superfluous information in great companies, but it doesn't say 
how am I really going to return and execute? So one of the big things that we've started uh, in most companies implementing, and you can call it a gate system or an execution methodology, is we use, most of the companies use a universal gate system of between six and seven stages. And during these stages, um, whether it's phase, PEL, or PEM, and it becomes more mandatory, it gives the financial institutions and it gives the owner the ability to look and identify the different opportunities to go forward. Yet the gate system tends to be considered only an EPCM tool. So the 11 billion that we've successfully put in place the past few years, every single one of them I had a gated process where we sat with the owner and I was able to sit with the financial institutions and analyze the cash flow. So it's a good decision making process and it, again, it's one of those recommended practices that's sort of starting to come into being. One of the other interesting tools uh, was developed is what we call the PDRI. And the PDRI basically is a problem probabilistic uh, rating system that allows you to analyze the data as you're staging. It allows you to work with the finances. And it is directly correlated that with the scores that you get on that is that your success of a project is directly attributed to it. So with the scoring system, what we have is we have, if you're greater than 200 on the score when you're doing it, and I sat with the owner and uh, you've got the contractor, we had the financer there. Every project that we had that was pretty much over 200 wound up being 10% over budget, 21% behind schedule, and basically exceeded the overall budget in the end by about 11%. These are statistics on close to 20, uh, $30 billion worth of work presented to the industry. So these are not just numbers we make up to sell for you. They're basically realistic. And in turn, every time I've had a score under, we tend to be under budget and uh, uh, be ahead of schedule. And this is actually, uh, allow change orders to basically be about 33% less than they are on a traditional project that exceeds. And the reason why these are important is when we're doing the finances, as much as we want to continue and try to remain on to the design bid process, we're in the end, most projects are starting to fast track. Why? If I, if I execute in 2016, it's going to cost me 13% more. If I execute in 2015, I'm going to save, but I'm just going to have uh, maybe some cost in labor and maybe some additional material costs. And we've even gotten to the methodology of flash track now that, hey, if I started in 2014, well, what this is doing is you're basically starting your construction financing in operations at an earlier phase. And as such, your bids start going up. What am I going to do? We're going to increase our risk contingency. What is the bank going to do when they fund the project or the loan entity? They're going to add a contingency level of 10 to 15 percent more uh, to it. So that's taking money out of the system for the company and it's taking money out for the financial institutions to loan. So what I try to do is we try to get in early. I try to get into the conceptual analysis and pre-planning. Try we try to get in the scope definition. And by utilizing these opportunities of influence, we're able to greatly help uh, both the financial institutions and uh, the owner in uh, succeeding in the projects. One of the last parts of this is we get into discussion. Earned value management is not a government mandated thing by the US government. It is a sound business practice. It's existed since, 60, since the 60s, formerly known as CSC. Um, and my grandfather taught me this in the 70s when he was using it in India and Pakistan. It just makes good business. It's not a government practice. It's used all over. And it just basically tells you, you initiate, you plan, you execute, you control, and you close out. There's not many financial institutions and owners that if you cannot present a system like this that they know they're going to have knowledgeable control, they're not going to have control of their system, it is, it, how is that not a benefit to you? So what we try to do, there's a criterion checklist that can be adapted both commercial and government. Um, it's utilized by the British, it's utilized by the Australians. It's now basically every major oil and gas company is using it. So it is a very sound practice. And it just allows you to get into your cost control. Uh, your financial basis, your implementation, and again, it just allows you to have an invoicing system of it you're realistically able to do. Uh, in Russia, we have a big problem. They award 25% of the value of the contract upon signature. Guess how many of those contracts? People don't come back for the next month. About 40%. We had a great amount of problems with that. Uh, when we put an EVM and control system in on the Conoco uh, Luke Oil Project joint venture called Narimar Nefty Gas, when I walked in, they were a billion dollars over budget and a year behind schedule. Put an EVM system place in, and we didn't go any more over budget. I didn't pull back on the schedule, 
but at least I didn't, I, we stopped the bleeding and put a sound system in place that the financial institutions were able to back because we were getting funding not just from CapEx and OpEx, but we had international financing, we had the Russian State Bank. So these are sound practices that can work. And again, it just allows you to present simple, simple graphs. It's remarkable when I put this in front of Rafaz and Alpha and Sparebank that the, the simple graph like that, instead of a, a traditional ROI graph where I could forecast for them and show them variances between cost and schedule, it gave them an immediate impact on what they're going to do. And they uh, started, it basically allowed them to allocate 25% more money into their projects if somebody put this system in place. And uh, Spurbank is the largest construction provider of uh, loans in Russia for capital projects. So the ability to predicate the information in the end came from a five-class estimating system. We use the estimating system to determine the contingencies. Um, it basically gives you your high values and project maturity levels. And this allows a bank and the uh, other financial institutions to make a determination if the process is within the lines. As such, I then can do my re a realistic probability distribution for decision and risk management. I can cut contingencies, may, numbers maybe from 40% to 20%, and you put, four, you put a 20% contingency level on a billion dollar project, you're talking the difference between probably funding it or not funding it. So in, what we do is we wrap up with just a sound risk management process. And again, you just gotta focus on your time and contingency, but the biggest problem about risk, people put a risk graph or they'll do a probabilistic risk study when they're doing their financial package, but they haven't really incorporated a decision. Why, why do we want to do it? What is the positives about that? So in conclusion, trying to shove two days into 20 minutes, and <laughs> um, financing is, needs to be commenced from the idea phase. Uh, I've had more successes with that. I've had projects uh, such as Western Refining. It allowed them to delay um, a project because they were in a panic. They had, they had to start spending uh, $200 million buying materials in November 2013. Instead, they could wait till July and August and use that money to sustain other projects and float and do an IPO for a logistics company and buy a second refinery. So by looking at it and starting from the beginning, they were able to increase their opportunity. The project management and control system, uh, you start at the beginning. You get a team in there, whether you call it a project management or an independent contractor, if you don't have it. Most uh, smaller mid-caps that would be working in this region are not going to have the ability to run a full uh, EP uh, project management system. So you hire your subject matter experts and it keeps your cost down. It's a system of internal reviews which leads to good ROI. It allows good sound evaluation and profit and opportunity. And in the end, it's been able to use project financing and utilization. Um, the last part I really like about it, which is, try again, trying to teach in Russia, everybody hears the rules, I teach ethics and transparency. This p p puts a very sound system. And as I said, the three late largest financiers really am, are starting to embrace this. Uh, we went from eight members of a financial institution uh, that were taking classes. We have more than 200 members in 18 months. And they have all said that they've, it's increased the value of their projects by 20%, which has been good for our exports and it's good for importing for you. Thank you very much. Somebody help me find my PowerPoint up here. Um, do I have a technical expert who can help me find where my PowerPoint is maybe? And I'll just say some. All right, yeah, that's it, it's the wrong page though. All right, I will just go from here. Um, let me give you an overview, sort of a context of what I'm talking about and why I'm talking about it. Um, I've been traveling a, not as much in the north as I'd like to, but I, I have gotten up there a bit, and what I see is tremendous economic potential uh, and serious infrastructure challenges. And so what we're trying to do with this panel, and I, I'd like to thank Tracy Ford from my staff for, for helping assemble such a, a very good group, is identify some extremely good financing tools which can make projects viable, which perhaps weren't fundable in the past. Now by projects, uh, we're talking really two major types of projects, infrastructure. Uh, infrastructure, I'm gonna define that broadly. By infrastructure, 
roads, ports, airports, certainly, uh, wastewater treatment, uh, medical facilities, uh, local sources of energy, renewable energy, schools, um, major projects involving natural resources. These tools work for these. Mining projects, forestry projects, fishing projects. Um, and these are really tools which, um, I mean, Sean and I have worked together for about 10 years, have been used all over the world uh, in markets which are frankly far more difficult than the Canadian North, uh, which is partly why these tools have been developed. Uh, if you look at some of the things, I was in Central Europe for a while, Russia for a while, uh, covering Ukraine, Georgia, Belarus. When you're trying to do a project in a fairly challenging country like Ukraine, it's very difficult to get traditional financing. Uh, banks are not going to write you a loan for a half billion dollar project in Ukraine for the most part. And if you're looking for the government of Ukraine to fund it, that's not going to happen. And so Sean and I did a couple projects together in Ukraine. We actually did one project in Georgia. What you end up doing in frontier markets is stitching together different types of financing. Uh, public sector, private sector, crown corporation, until you have something that's viable. Now, I, I came to Canada after almost 20 years in working in the former Soviet Union, and what was remarkable to me was, you know, Canada's an incredibly sophisticated country, but it didn't look like anybody had even heard of U.S. Export-Import Bank and what it could do. So when I talked particularly in the North to people about major projects, uh, what I was hearing was, well, uh, the government in Ottawa was going to give us the money. So that was option one. And option two was, well, what we don't get out of Ottawa, we're going to go to a bank and they'll give it to us at 12%. And so what we're trying to do is present methods which have been used in much more difficult markets, which can make the projects that are sort of iffy fundable, or projects that are go projects, where you're looking at 12% financing from a commercial bank, uh, you can use tools like EDC, US Export Import Bank, and introduce some much lower cost financing as a piece of it, so that way the overall project is a 7% rate. And if your hurdle rate is a 7%, that means a lot more projects are viable. Um, if you look at how many projects are viable at 12% anywhere in the world, it's hard to find a project that is going to be feasible at a 12%, and that's why these tools are crucial. A couple caveats. Um, it's all about does the project work financially? Will the lender get the money back? If the project's not financially viable, don't waste your time. It's not going to work. Go talk to the prime minister. Maybe he'll give you the money. Uh, a second thing, extremely important, any of these projects, if you're dealing with Canadian government financing, U.S. government financing, international financing, there must be an environmental assessment and it must be an environmentally friendly project or it doesn't go anywhere. Third thing is job creation. Does the job create a net economic benefit in terms of job retention or creation for the local community in Canada? And if you're talking about U.S. Export Import Bank, they'll look at that, plus they're also going to ask, does it create a couple jobs in the U.S.? Now, as an overview, what all this means. Um, any major project in Canada, mining project, harbor, airport, is inevitably going to have a large portion of U.S. content. Um, I've seen and, and, and this is, even if it's completely Canadian managed, you will inevitably have tons of U.S. content, often as much as 60 or 70 percent. Um, anytime you have U.S. content, it is possible to use U.S. Export-Import Bank financing. So, uh, Export-Import Bank, you know, you're buying a bunch of Boeings, Export-Import Bank does Boeings, but one of the most frequent users of Export-Import Bank is Caterpillar. Uh, our friends at Caterpillar who build all those wonderful tractors and dump trucks and bulldozers, anybody who's building a port or an airport or a harbor or a mining project, you're going to be using Caterpillar equipment. When Ex-Imbac sees Caterpillar equipment, they're happy. They're comfortable with Caterpillar. 
Um, and so this becomes one piece which you mix and match in your blend of financing. Um, now, I am not permitted to quote you what rate XM will offer you. I get in trouble occasionally when I do that in public forums. Let us just say substantially less than the 12% that a bank will offer you, and, and I can go that far. Um, now, this is a little bit technical. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Say you have a $100 million project. You can identify 40 million of that as U.S. content, which could be your caterpillars. Uh, it could be some U.S. engineering firm that's helping you out. All of that U.S. content is eligible for export-import bank financing. And if you're talking about hiring a major U.S. engineering construction firm, a lot of the local stuff which that U.S. firm buys is export-import bank financed as well. Am I running out of time? People are glaring at me or I'm good? Okay. Um, another particular priority for U.S. export-import bank is renewable energy. Uh, U.S. export-import bank, in fact, has an informal quota to meet uh, where a certain amount of U.S. export-import bank financing needs to go into renewable energy projects, which, of course, include hydro projects, which you're all familiar with, tidal projects, wind energy, solar projects. A very severe challenge XM is facing is finding enough projects of this size in order to fulfill that quota. So in other words, for every million dollars XM wants to spend selling Boeings all over the world, uh, they have to find $100,000 of renewable energy projects. One of the best places to find bankable renewable energy projects of large scale is in Canada, specifically the Canadian North. So any of you who want to talk about this in detail, you will find a very open door with me and with my colleagues in Washington. Um, now I'll go on to the more technical details. Um, this is addressed to um, U.S. companies are the major users of XM's projects. So in many cases, you're working with the U.S. counterpart, and it becomes the U.S. company that's applying to XM on your behalf. But these are products which apply to Canadian buyers' U.S. capital equipment. First, the direct loan to buy the equipment, a loan guarantee, and if you have a loan guarantee from XM, that brings down the cost of capital for your bank financing because there means there's less risk for the bank. And there's uh, just a guarantee for political risk, which generally is not that big an issue here in Canada. Uh, XM is quite happy to be the senior lender. Uh, there are transaction parameters. With XM, you're looking at a loan size of at least $10 million. In terms of most of the projects you're working on, you're going to be above that threshold. If you're looking for something which is less than $10 million, the U.S. Small Business Administration has similar type programs. You'd work with Small Business Administration instead of USXM. Uh, generally, length of term is going to be over 10 years. And there are different ways to structure these projects. I will attempt to get in some of these technical aspects. Um, and I will try to explain a little more detail if I'm going too fast because I don't want to. Okay, two types of finance which you should be looking at if you're talking at large infrastructure projects. Um, there is the more traditional structured financing approach, which is basically you as the institution are using your money as the guarantor. So in other words, you're the institution, you're a native corporation, you're a native government, you're basically getting a loan from XM based upon your assets and projected cash flows. Uh, this is one approach to it. Uh, another approach is the project finance approach, which personally I like to look at the project finance approach because it, not, it means you're not putting the balance sheet of your corporation there. Uh, what we're doing with the project finance approach is we look at the project itself. Uh, is it a mine? Is it an airport? Is it a harbor? Is it a toll road? We look at the revenues for that project, for that road, that airport, once it's built, and it's the future revenues from the project which actually provide the security for the loan financing. Now, what, what's 
troubling and difficult about a group like this is I've got 20% of the people in the room who are going, yes, I know this, why are you wasting my time? And the other 80% are going, I'm not quite sure what he's talking about, so forgive me if I'm not hitting my audience smack on. You're, you're sort of a large group. Um, now, this is true of all, um, you'll find European countries, Japanese, everybody has their own version of an XM bank. You will find fairly similar terms from all of them because these are guided by OECD agreements. And, and these are the basic terms you're gonna see from any, uh, any foreign export bank in terms of structured finance or project finance. That's what the deal is going to look like. Uh, I will say about US Export Import Bank, um, that they are going, USXM is going to be more aggressive and be willing to do more things in Canada than European banks because our comfort level in Canada is very high and because the amount of US export import bank exposure in Canada is very low. So in other words, there, there's an awful big quota for Canada XM would like to fill. Um, I think another factor is that XM and EDC have a memorandum of understanding which they've negotiated uh, where we essentially work together. It's co-financing arrangement. So for EDC to finance a Canadian portion of the project, USXM to finance the US content, work together in a very collegial way, extremely easy for these two institutions to do it, which is why we're both up here. Um, a little more on project finance. Uh, Project finance is about setting up a separate entity, a, a bookkeeping entity, which is the project. It's the port authority, it's the airport authority, which then, rather than the host government or the native corporation, becomes the source of the cash flow. It is essentially a special purpose vehicle. Um, here is, how much more time, how much more time do I have here? Eight minutes. Okay, I'm good. Uh, this is a wee bit complicated, but this is what a project finance structure is gonna look like. And, and I think for most projects in the North, this is an extremely good approach. Um, you've got your host government on top. Uh, the SPV is your specific vehicle set up for either the mine or the airport or the school or the renewable energy facility. Um, in the case of a mine, it's your off taker. Um, say you're talking about a major mining project, you know that mine is going to produce titanium, it's going to produce iron. Before the mine's completed, you negotiate hopefully an offtake agreement with the people who are going to buy this, saying if you can produce it, we will buy a certain amount of it at this level. So that offtake agreement, and now it can be an offtake agreement for an airport, for example, and Sean and I worked on a very interesting project in Ukraine, Lviv Airport, and what Sean was great at doing was finding off-take agreements for a $100 million airport. And Sean would go out to different airlines, um, who I won't name, and basically say, if I can build a really nice international airport in Lviv instead of that dumpy thing they've got there, uh, do you think you would fly into it once a week? And so Sean was able to conclude a number of off-take agreements. Now, once you have an off-take agreement, whether it's for a harbor, port, airport, mine, whatever, you're essentially saying, okay, I know what the revenue source is going to be, those offtake agreements are gonna go right into my special purpose vehicle, that corporation, which is the mine or the airport, that's gonna be the future cash flow. And so your lender, in this case, XM Bank or the traditional bank, can look at it and say, that's really interesting, I can see those cash flows, I'm willing to make a loan based upon that. Um, then you've got your input contracts, in other words, what are the contracts that are needed in order to actually build the airport or the mine? Uh, the O&M, Operation and Maintenance, so you're setting up a contract with whoever is going to be operating the mine, the airport, or the port. And your EPC. Uh, EPC is what is your U.S. content that is going into that. So your EPC is typically Caterpillar equipment. Or if you're doing an airport, who are the major vendors of airport equipment, especially air traffic control systems? Uh, this is a whole ton of work. Uh, there's another piece of it which... Uh, is tricky to do in emerging markets. Uh, this becomes the equity piece. So most of these projects are gonna be primarily debt, but your lender, because there will often be a bank lender getting involved in this, is gonna to wanna to see, 
okay, it's a $1 billion project. I'd really like to see $100 million of equity here. Uh, maybe it's the native corporation putting in the equity. Maybe it's the provincial government. Or in some cases, one only needs to put in a little bit from the native corporation. Because if you can develop a mine or an airport or a project with all these pieces, and you're going to Exim in a bank, um, and you're getting loans, you're often going to have a project which has a very, very positive rate of return and very highly leveraged, which means it will be very popular with a private equity firm. And, and one would be amazed at the type of things that global private equity firms are ready to invest in if the project is structured in the right way. Uh, and so many times what happens in the Canadian North, as well as many other places in the world, is we need to work hard on project structuring and, and work with experts like Sean on getting a project structured properly so it's presentable, so it can get the finance that it needs. Okay. Oh, I went backwards, excuse me. I'll, I'll get the hang of this device probably by the end of my presentation. Um, now, this is the project finance process when you're working with Exim Bank. This is going to be similar for any other project financing that you're going to be doing. Um, one thing that is very positive about Exim Bank, very positive tool, is you can go to Exim Bank for a letter of intent. Um, last time I did something like this, cost $100, which basically says, Here's the project, this is what we plan to do, these are the parameters the project will have. If you want the letter of intent, come talk to me. Uh, I'm technically the XM Bank representative for Canada. And XM will come back and say, if this project reaches all of these criteria, then yes, XM would be very interested in financing it. Now, it's not a binding commitment by XM Bank. Uh, it is something which XM can generally produce in about a week. But when you want to go to talk to other investors, to talk to lenders, to talk to people at offtake agreements, having that letter of commitment from Exim Bank is a very important first step because it shows the U.S. government serious about what you're doing. Uh, phase two, uh, these are the, the different phases that one goes through in Exim. When you're talking about very large projects, it actually goes through a congressional review. The projects over 100 million have to go through U.S. Congress. So I will say the XM process is, for very large projects, a rather slow project. And I've had a lot of private sector firms come to me and say, oh, well, we don't have time to waste on XM. We'll just get the money from a bank and it'll take much less time because we're in a hurry. I see them two years later and they still don't have anything. So it, it may look slow, but, but it's steady and sure. And there's a lot to be said for that. Um, so these are contact points. Uh, here I am. Let's have Tracy stand up again if she... Where is Tracy? Okay, Tracy Ford, you just saw. Tracy Ford is my specialist on the Canadian North. Uh, Jan Blaho, who I've known for about 15 years, he ran the first uh, bank, U.S. bank in Slovakia. He was CEO of a bank, and he retired from that. He is now the XM lender for the Chicago area, tremendously knowledgeable about project finance, and he has a very specific interest in the Canadian North. So more technical questions, definitely Jan will be happy to talk to you. So thank you very much. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks very much. The nice thing about <clears throat> batting cleanup is you don't have to hear about a lot of project finance detail from me, nor do you have to hear a lot about how an export credit bank works. Um, so I stood up and said, what, what's the message I want you, want you to leave with today? And I've got a couple of, uh, couple of items that uh, I, I'll, I'll provide some context around, but I really want to be able to convey to you why <coughs> you would include EDC, your official export credit institution, uh, in your early plans as you look to develop uh, projects in the north. So with that, I said I wouldn't be comfortable unless I'd answered at least three whys for you. The first one, of course, being why is 
Canada's Export Credit Agency involved or interested in playing a very comprehensive role helping us develop the North. I want to make sure that you understand why we as an organization are qualified to sit uh, together with this illustrious panel and, uh, and have you hear our story. And last of all, I, I wanted to pitch my own organization and ensure that you're comfortable that we would be a good long-term partner and one that you can get talking to seriously early in the process. I'll talk a little bit about uh, EDC. I know Rich said he was a little bit surprised that there are many Canadians who haven't <clears throat> either heard of US Exim Bank or don't know what it does. I'm equally surprised by the number of Canadians who um, know EDC as an insurance company but don't know it as a, uh, a serious solution provider for a number of different financing issues that come along. So first of all, we are the, uh, the official credit agency for Canada. And I'm going to actually read uh, the, the, the second bullet point because I need to dissect it a little bit. Our mandate is to support and develop Canada's export trade by helping Canadian companies respond to international business opportunities. This, by the way, is uh, uh, a, a wonderful mandate because it's wide open and uh, you know, we can get involved in a tremendous number of things. Obviously, the support part of uh, uh, our mandate occurs once a transaction has already occurred, you've already exported something, you want to make sure you get paid for it, or your buyer wants to, uh, to receive some long-term financing. The second piece of that mandate, the, the ability to develop Canada's capability, is where we've been, uh, been most, uh, sort of, I would say, most uh, creative over the last, uh, the last five years, where we've spent a lot of time uh, in a financial crisis, and some might argue we're, we're, we're coming out of it now, but, but that's where EDC has been able to shine, looking at the development of Canada's capacity to engage in global trade. Um, and the last, the, the, the third bullet point, of course, is meant for all my friends out there who uh, keep accusing me of uh, spending Canada's tax dollars supporting projects that are either slow to develop or the value isn't abundantly clear. We are self-financing. Uh, so we operate on principally on commercial principles. Uh, we have paid a dividend back to the Canadian government, a sizable one in the last two years, um, the last year, and we, 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 because the rules are already established, we know we're going to pay a significant dividend. But, and that's where there's a little difference between what EDC does and what USXM does. We, we operate a little more like a bank. We don't go for an annual allocation. Um, we are not as, uh, we don't have to go to Parliament to approve transactions over a certain amount. We already have those powers and they are uh, overseen by our, our stakeholder. Um, quickly, EDC provides sort of four different areas and I, I, I singled out SME solutions as well, because this is a, an area that the government has been very interested in promoting over the last while, and you see part of my presentation is going to be focused on what EDC would like to do for Canadian companies that aren't you know, the providers of yellow metal and uh, it, it, companies that understand how large project finance and contact with banks work. How do we get smaller Canadian suppliers into the supply chain so that they can take advantage of some of the projects that we've all been, uh, been hearing about. The insurance, SME solutions, bonding, which is really contract assurance, ensuring that foreign buyers are comfortable that the Canadian company can, uh, can meet its obligations through the contract. And last but not least, finance, which of course includes project finance. It includes, uh, uh, it includes regular, regular corporate debt. Uh, to an extent, it also includes a small amount of equity as well. So that finance sort of encapsulates all of that. What, what was I thinking about today when I came in front of you? Uh, looking at essentially three areas. I'll try to focus this, uh, the, this presentation on that. And then quite willing to, uh, to, uh, to take questions from the floor about whether we can go beyond that. But clearly, mining oil and gas, exploration, development, um, transportation, 
And then last but not least, um, obviously infrastructure, which uh, is, is going to be key. And you've seen governments already start to talk about what they need to do to open up, uh, open up the north to these major projects. I've also put on this slide the term integrative trade. Um, I, I, have to, uh, I have to give credit for that, uh, for that phrase to the current uh, governor of the Bank of Canada who used to be my boss. Um, but essentially what Stephen was trying to get more EDC uh, employees to think about is what I talked about getting SMEs involved or small and medium-sized enterprises involved in a global supply chain. There, there is very little made in Canada, put in a black box and stamped with a maple leaf and shipped overseas. We don't have uh, the large, we don't have a plethora of uh, global corporations, uh, unlike the US, uh, where everything is made in Canada. We have to find ways where we can integrate Canadian capability and production into somebody else's package. So that's become very important over the last five years. And I think Richard pointed out that uh, we, have, we have a memorandum of understanding with USXM. We've actually done deals with them where um, EDC has been able to bring that supply chain into the delivery of something that might ostensibly looked at as, as a sort of a US project. Quickly, um, for, for people who, uh, who wonder what EDC actually does, uh, Debt project finance. You've heard uh, you've heard of both of those. Uh, both of, well, you've heard more about the project finance solution, but I can tell you that debt is becoming an increasingly important way of financing a project. Project financing very expensive, very uh, requires a, a, a fair amount of infrastructure around the transaction itself to get done. Um, I can talk to you about two major Canadian gold mining companies. Who, uh, who had project finance either well underway or had term sheets, uh, and they turned around and said, no, we prefer to go the debt route because we have a balance sheet that can, uh, can support it. So uh, really do encourage you uh, to think about good old boring debt. It's what's kept me employed for 30 years, and I don't want to throw it out too fast. Um, but project finance obviously is a... a, a, is a going to be a key source of the huge amounts of capital that will be required to develop projects uh, in the north. Uh, political risk insurance is why EDC was created in the first place. We hope there isn't a lot of political risk with the, uh, the Canadian North, but uh, I, I put it there because often there are, there are ramifications to who is actually taking the offtake and whether there, uh, whether there are risks there that, uh, that EDC might be called on to insure. Uh, performance assurance, this is that bonding product I talked about, something that's used extensively in the oil and gas as well as in the mining sector. And again, <clears throat> operators need to get governments convinced that uh, they will actually live up to their obligations of cleanup at the end of the project or that, these, uh, that they will have uh, a certain amount of uh, work done on the project itself, so minimum work bonds. Um, and, and, and I see this as being sort of a key role for EDC to play because we do understand many of the, uh, the operators and we've worked with them uh, in, in, in that particular area before. Last point, credits insurance, what most of you probably know EDC best for, and this is just a classic, once you've sold something to a buyer, EDC provides either the, uh, uh, the exporter or the bank with uh, uh, insurance against non-payment or default of that, uh, of that obligation. So why would you talk to, uh, to EDC in particular? Um, and I, I say that for the last 20 years, EDC has been working uh, both in the extractive and the, and, and extractive is both mining as well as oil and gas, uh, and the infrastructure sectors. We are a stable source of capital. Um, in 2009, when uh, the financial crisis uh, caused many banks to withdraw their ability, their, their, they, they sort of tightened up uh, uh, their requirements around, uh, around providing loans. I was there watching term sheets being pulled away from people. EDC was uh, essentially asked by the Canadian government 
to, to provide more domestic financing to ensure that that liquidity remained in place. And essentially, they waived our requirement to sort of exclude ourselves from domestic transactions. And I can say that we were able to exercise those powers in a particularly uh, uh, capable way. We did it uh, without squeezing the banks out of the business. We worked in collaboration with them. And you will, you will likely see uh, in March of this year the powers for EDC to actually, in certain instances, provide support to domestic projects will be extended indefinitely, will be built into our act. So, uh, you know, the fact that we were a stable and consistent source of, of uh, financing during that period of time uh, has come back and, and allowed us to be even more, uh, more uh, I guess, embedded in, in transactions where we see domestic capability opening up export markets. <clears throat> EDC has, obviously, global experience to bring to bear. Uh, it's great to have a mining industry that essentially raises 70% of its capital in Canada. So uh, EDC has followed major operators to you know, Russia, Mongolia, uh, uh, Mos um, Madagascar, Mauritania, uh, looking at uh, opportunities in Africa. Uh, South America, of course, uh, we've had uh, the good and the bad there, but EDC's been in those markets for a, a really extended period of time, and so we do bring global best practice to Canadian projects as well. Um, because, there are, because both the oil and gas and the mining industry are so prevalent in Canada, we have first-hand experience in dealing with the project sponsors, consulting engineers, uh, the actual operators of the facility. Um, and, and we have an internal culture of working together with small and medium enterprises to try and promote their role in projects. Um, you know, when a mining company buys yellow metal, uh, you, can, you can certainly turn to, to US Exxon, but what about the, uh, the Canadian small Canadian shop that uh, uh, needs to modify that equipment and service it over a 10-year period up north. It's hard for them sometimes to get financing from, uh, uh, from a big project sponsor. EDC has, uh, has crafted a role where we, uh, where we aggregate some of that capability and we support them on the way through, providing essentially working capital uh, as well as performance guarantees as we go forward. Um, something that I really didn't think a lot about uh, until three or four years ago is the, the, the halo effect of working with, with EDC. Every export credit agency, and, and Richard already alluded to this, uh, you know, one of the first things you have to think about is what's the project going to do? How is it going to be, how is it going to be uh, viewed by the public? And, and so, if it doesn't have an excellent corporate social responsibility story, if the environmental due diligence isn't done to the highest standards, um, it, it, it's not a project that's going to move forward. And EDC has had a lot to do with multilateral agencies as well as the other export credit agencies and the project finance corporate banks to ensure that uh, this is something that is, uh, is very highly considered. Um, Something new and, and, and probably more appropriate to, uh, to our north is uh, uh, an increased respect for First Nations objectives. Um, I, was, I was truly blown away by uh, an Australian company who came to talk to me about a project in, uh, in Saskatchewan. And the first thing they wanted to talk about was what were EDC's plans about involving First Nations in, in, in a more comprehensive way. And so it's, this is registering much better with EDC as we go forward, and I see it being a key part of whether we'll be successful uh, supporting northern development. Um, we've also developed this partnership preferred model. Um, EDC does not want to, or doesn't really find itself in a situation where it is the sole provider of a solution. Really do want to work with U.S. Exim, uh, other consulting uh, uh, entities, uh, uh, corporate banks. Uh, there are sources of funding now outside of uh, of those groups, and we're starting to develop them. They may be uh, they may be equity funds, they may be sovereign wealth funds, 
Uh, they may be other, other qualified investors, and so we found that being able to leverage our, our knowledge base and our willingness to, uh, to work in a sort of a commercially uh, uh, expedient way has allowed us to broaden this and, uh, and, and partnerships have allowed us to bring to the table large amounts of capital that uh, we would never be able to, to, to cover on our own. Um, so I, I, at, at the, as I went through this process, I hope I've answered those, you know, why is EDC interested in, in positioning uh, the North, opening up the North, what's well, there principally because there is so much opportunity and it's almost all export oriented. So if we're able to, uh, to get projects moving forward, um, th these are the new exporters of uh, the, next, uh, the next 25 years. Um, why would you talk to EDC? Uh, you know, I've talked about our experience and, 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 those, uh, and, and those capabilities as well. Um, and, you know, the Canadian government is my single shareholder. So what, uh, what they are interested in just absolutely is sort of key from our perspective. And the government, the federal government, is, uh, is, is focused on delivering uh, the, the, the infrastructure and capability for development up north. And EDC will, will certainly come along. But after I sort of said, hopefully I've covered off those points, I'm struck by the fact that you know, Canada is truly one of the most friendly jurisdictions for resource development. Um, so if you are a company looking to, you know, there, I, I cannot think of too many better jurisdictions to be, uh, to be looking to develop natural resources. Um, makes a lot of sense for us to, uh, to, to be focused on our north because there's such tremendous opportunity there. Um, our country has a, has a very long history uh, in, in resource development. We have, we, we have a profound way of being able to solve problems that, that come up in this area because we've been at it for so long. We talked about uh, my, my shareholders' tremendous interest in making sure that uh, the North does develop in a acceptable way and EDC is clearly aligned all the way through our board and our executive to, to do everything to support that, uh, that initiative. Having said all of that, you know, it always strikes me that uh, I, I did some of my research by looking at a, uh, a board paper that EDC had presented to our board back in 2011 and I was struck by how little progress had actually occurred over the last three years. And so, I do, I do sit back and say the issues, I recognize the issues are incredibly complex. Um, you know, we're talking about projects that will be around for 35 to 40 years. It's not going to happen particularly quickly. Um, and, and so if we don't get the first steps right, you know, things will be, will be bogged down. And so I encourage you to reach out to EDC, reach out to uh, uh, DFAT-D, who, uh, who has a, a, a strong interest in working with projects as, they, as they're launched up north. Um, but, but engage us early, <clears throat> because there, are, there is a lot of advice we can provide before we get to the, uh, the, uh, the situation of, of actually issuing term sheets or you seeing money from us. And um, a lot of it is provided in a, uh, uh, in a very cost-effective way. It's free. Um, so, uh, uh, with that, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll move on. Very good, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Sean and Richard and Mark for those very insightful remarks. And uh, now we'll open it up for the fun time. Questions from you. The uh, microphone's uh, on both sides there, and we've got, uh, we're right on schedule. And um, so, Please help yourself to questions. Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> unless I missed it, I did not hear any references uh, to P3 projects. And as we know, those are becoming more prevalent uh, in the north. The Calwood Airport project, for example, is a P3. So I'm curious to know if uh, any of your financing terms or the project management that you talked about uh, would have to change, have changed, or would change. Uh, with the P3 project where the proponents are, you know, taking, potentially taking on more risk for, say, a 30-year operating and uh, maintenance agreement in, in addition to the construction of a, of a project. Okay, I'll, 
I'll just speak for the American side of it. Um, having it structured as a P3, if you're doing all of the paperwork to organize a P3, it means you set up your special financing vehicle. So if you've gone through all the paperwork for P3, you've done many of the steps you need to pursue XM financing. Uh, if you, the, the question XM has is not what is the structure, what is the U.S. content? That's the basic question. If there's U.S. content in the P3, XM's interested. Sean? Yeah. Well, actually interesting uh, for anybody in construction, P3, all of a sudden I start thinking planning and scheduling in P6. So uh, <laughs> the big issue uh, when we have on project financing, and now I got my mind back into that track, um, when I deal with the owners operators is making sure, as we said, the U.S. content, uh, the con contribution to local community, the all the elements of which we can justify to do the cash flow uh, package. So on the government side, I, that's where I tend to lean into uh, Rich or I would get into EDC or EBRD of how we could structure the financing with as many entities as we can uh, to minimize the required capex and opex. And that's what we try to focus on when we build their, build your business plans. Apology from my perspective if I didn't, we didn't actually mention P3 separately, but quite frankly, I don't see, like, like the other uh, panel members, I don't see a huge difference between a structured project financing and possibly a P3 uh, project. But what I would say is that we, EDC has uh, identified a number of Canadian equity funds that uh, are P3 sponsors outside of the country. And so we have worked very, at very early stages, not so much necessarily just with the project, but actually working with the, P, with the P3, P3 sponsor to ensure that there are some other things other than just the project finance in place. And so, uh, quite honestly, I, 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 the EDC is wide open to considering uh, a P3 type of solution, which might take the, you know, opening up a new hospital in, uh, in up north that would be, uh, that would be sort of focused on, on servicing uh, of industrial, industrial sites. That, that, I mean, that is right up our alley and not very different than the sort of assessment we do when we look at a pure project finance. Okay, further questions? Well, they have unfortunate few. There you go, good. Because they've provided me with a list of questions to ask them if you don't, so I'd rather you do it. All right. Um, my name is uh, John Wood. I'm the CEO of the SPV up at Taylor. Um, and my question is moving on from what you were saying. Um, I think the alignment of financing for the procurement process in the data on P3 is probably quite hard. Two of the main technical figures. And you just alluded to the fact that you're having these discussions with sponsors about the long term involvement. Is that something that both organisations are looking at? I can certainly say for EDC, absolutely. Um, you know, that, that, that's the nature of the P3, it, uh, and, and it's probably, I, I'll be quite honest, if you talk to most Canadian financial institutions and try and get them to think about the tenor of a project, they don't tend to, to, to think in, in, in 30 year chunks. It's, it's usually under, uh, under a, a, even 10 years is pushing it for a project type of, uh, exposure for them. So you do need to, uh, the skills that we've developed globally looking at longer term projects are applicable as well to the type of contracts that we're looking for the, uh, the, PP, the P3 sponsors to, to bring to the table. Okay. I, I would say for us, um, Canada has unparalleled experience in P3 and, and I wish America had half of the experience in P3 that Canada does. However, just from the standpoint of XM lending, generally P3 is going to be a positive thing. Just because there's so much legal structuring and due diligence one has to go through to set up the P3 structure, it means you're almost all the way there anyway. And similar, generally when we do the, the matrix on matching up on the system, <coughs> On the business decision, it basically can, for me on the side, be a 10 to 15% contingency difference if I know that's in place. And as I said, that 
you know, ten percent of a, of a billion dollars is a hundred million dollars. That's just straight simple math. So that's the funding difference for me on decision. Because if not, I'm going to be, you know, I'm, I'm going to use a hundred million of my operating cost, or hopefully oil stays at ninety-five hundred dollars a barrel, and I can extract it. So uh, that means I can't do maybe a, a sustainability project. Uh, hate to say it. Current administration put in some very tight for me in the oil and gas regulatory issues that have to be passed by 2014 and 2016. That means I cannot do sustainability projects if I've got to delegate that other 100 million because I have to do the regulatory first. So on my matrixing, it's very important that the more of that structure we have and the more entities we can get in, we can start juggling numbers, as Richard said, from 12 percent. We were bringing in stuff at 3.3 percent for the Lviv airport. Yeah. Well, I'll, Trump, why don't you talk about the finance structure for Lviv Airport, because it's, <laughs> it's not dissimilar from doing an airport on Baffin Island. The Lviv Airport was a, ma was a mandated government project for people in support of the Euro 2012 program. Um, they, That's a big world soccer match. Yeah. And they basically uh, made the first public-private partnership offering, and it came down to a Polish company and uh, the firm I was working with. And we worked with, we, the, the Polish group obviously was working with the EBRD and independent Polish financers. We were working with USXM, OPEC, and others. The big issues that we have is remote location and justification. Why do people want to come to the north? Um, you know, some people may not, it, you know, it's not the tourism destination. I was reading the paper like Turk and Calicos. Uh, but it offers it, all the infrastructure in need. So Lviv was not really focused on its tourism as a great place. They needed cargo and transportation and infrastructure because industry wanted to build. So such that was the financial justification we used on it. And as Rich said, we went out there when the airport was done. We, based, uh, we went out and my marketing team and we talked to numerous airlines. We talked to Boeing about trying to build a facility instead of everything going into Russia to maybe build a facility to service all the jets more than eight. Eastern Europe, which saves about five hours of gas. Um, so utilizing all those information, we pretty much had funded the project. It became more, the Ukrainian government didn't think we could pull it off and sort of started throwing, every time you walk in with 10 million bucks, they wanted 20 million in another document. I don't see that in Northern Canada. So the structure would work very similar. You get the matrix, you get the financing, we can get the contractors to build it. And that's probably the most important part, and that's why I was excited to come here. I'm, I live in Houston, and I work with the Canadian Club down there. I'm part of the U.S.-Russian cha Chamber of Commerce and French Chamber of Commerce, and using these facilities is a way for me to export, but it helps my chamber members. So, yeah. but, but I also say from a standpoint of getting these projects off the ground, um, it's very, very helpful to have a skilled project management firm or a skilled construction engineering firm. Um, I, I remember doing a trade mission to Georgia. They all wanted Bechtel to come on the trade mission. We brought Bechtel. That was nice. And Bechtel, wonderful firm, will say, if the thing's not a billion dollars, we're not interested. Most of you aren't at that stage. So what, what you can find in both Canada and the U.S. are, I'd say, mid-sized U.S. project management firms, construction engineering firms with extremely good resumes on, on doing projects all over the world in the, call it the $100 million to $300 million range. And if you can get one of these firm in, firms interested in what you're working on, then they can start structuring the financing bringing in the potential future clients to do the offtake, talking to private equity people, talking to banks. So the, the critical thing, I think, is finding these project management construction engineering firms who want to work with you and get the project moving. And well, I would say this. Yeah, yeah. The, those are the ones that they, they, they don't want to come in and be your permanent staff. They come in with a, literally a cookbook to deal with people. Um, and they're basically trying to move through, execute your project, and go on to the next project. It's a transfer of technology. The longer they hang with you, the more counterproductive it is for you as an entity. You're not going to get, it's going to drag you out. And that's sort of the, a more of a new trend uh, where a lot of, a lot of the small, small and mids 
can really just staff augment you and get you going, and that's key. Yeah. They train they, locally. They, they rely on local labor because they, they don't have the staff to bring a whole bunch of people up north. And it's not economically viable for me to bring somebody up at, you know, who's going to want to per diem at 150 a day or something like that when I can bring somebody local in and I can build a school, hospitals. Um, we've built um, airport, small infrastructure airports in Kazakhstan. So we're the smaller ones. We have a little bit more, we're, we're, we're client oriented. And that's what's really, as I said, I think that's the difference on project financing. Find that guy who cares about your community. Okay. We have time for probably one more question. Yes. Yeah, we're going we're going to rephrase it. I, I think you're asking what's the what's the next frontier, right? All right. Who wants to tackle that simple little question? Uh, okay, I I've been up to north quite a bit. Clearly there's huge economic opportunity long term and short term. I think the biggest difficulty is the global business community isn't noticing. Uh, for a conference of this importance, there really aren't that many foreigners here. And, and, and I think it's somehow alerting the world, and, and I would say the rest of Canada, I would say the U.S., these are prime targets, to say the opportunity exists, please work with us, let's do something. And, and the difficulty is we're talking about uh, a very global market for dollars and a very global competition just for attention and, you know, right now everybody's all into the BRIC, Brazil, India, China. I mean, that this, everybody thinks, oh boy, that's where everything is. Very few people think Canada North, that's interesting. So it's acquiring visibility and, and attracting, and it may not even be a huge number of people. It may just be three or four people who have access to the expertise, access to the capital, who can get interested and get things moving. But, but it's very difficult because there's so many opportunities in the world right now, it is extremely difficult to get the right people to pay attention. If I had to say one thing is uh, the North reminds me right now of where Kazakhstan was 20, 25 years ago. When I went into Kazakhstan, I had no infrastructure. Basically, I had an antiquated Soviet rail. We had to build jump airports, and yet I'm supposed to bring in literally a billion dollars of infrastructure equipment to build refineries, housing, and like that. The north right now would remind me of that, is that you start building the infrastructure between the rails, the harbors, and the airports, that's going to open up the opportunities. The people will start hubbing, you got cities. The city of Astana, which is the capital of Kazakhstan, did not exist when I first went in there. It was a village. And I was there last year teaching at Nazarov University, and they basically are associated with Duke and Cambridge and expanding out faster. So it's sort of thing. If you build the infrastructure and you Advertise it enough, people will come if it's economically viable. And right now, the North is the Kazakhstan of 20 years ago. And that's just a personal opinion for somebody who was in Kazakhstan in the mid-90s. in the mid -90s. But, of course, when, I mean, I was in the former Soviet Union in the mid-90s, and at that point, practically nobody was, going, you know, people were flocking in in Moscow in droves, but nobody really was looking at Tashkent that seriously. Nobody was that serious about Kalku. It was frontier type people, very skilled, very daring entrepreneurs who were working with local people and getting, getting them excited and getting things moving. But I mean, it, it, certainly in 1992, nobody thought Kazakhstan was going to turn into what it is today. Nobody, I think, thought about that about North Dakota 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah, I guarantee that. <clears throat> well, our time is up. Please join me in thanking Sean and Richard and Mark for their insightful comments. Thank you very much.
Good job, guys. Thank you very much. I definitely need to get you. Charity. Charity. Well, because I'd like to share some stuff with you.